In this video, I'm going to talk about process tracing or what I call traditional process tracing. In the next video, I'm going to talk about Bayesian process tracing or formal Bayesian process tracing, which is a more recent development or a recent method. I like to start off with this image of Sherlock Holmes because process tracing is a lot like detective work. <clears throat> we have suspects, alternative explanations of the outcome of the case, and we have evidence, clues, and clues can be either things we know to look for because we have hypotheses that suggest the clues should be there or not, or there are things that we stumble across that may then fit some hypothesis we've already thought of, or they may lead us to some new hypothesis or some new suspect that we hadn't thought of before. So I think there's a lot of parallels between detective work and process tracing. So I'm going to define uh, process tracing as a within-case form of analysis. It has uh, uh, both a deductive side and an inductive side. Uh, deductively, we have theories in our heads in advance, and we, they predict certain evidence in the case and certain processes and, and uh, uh, observable implications in the case, and we'll look for those. And inductively, uh, we're looking at sequences, we're looking at events, we're just soaking and poking in the evidence from the case, and that may lead us to some new theoretical ideas, or we may find some evidence that fits some of the theories or explanations that we already had. But it's a within case, it proceeds one case at a time, trying to understand the causes of the outcomes of that particular case. So the particular mix of inductive and deductive uh, uh, approach will depend on how much you already know about theories, about the case, and so on. And it'll be different mix for each project. Or you might start off thinking it's going to be deductive and then just inductively come across some evidence that leads you in a whole new direction. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, in my book with Jeff Chekel, we've outlined 10 best practices for process tracing. And I'm going to work through uh, these, uh, not in equal detail, but uh, uh, mention several aspects of different ones. <clears throat> so the first point is to cast a wide net for alternative explanations. Uh, I always urge people to start off as deductively as they can with existing theories, because that's fast and cheap and easy. And I urge that you should cast the net widely because uh, there, it's a bigger problem if you leave out some powerful explanation than if you s spend a little time with a lot of explanations and maybe quickly exclude some based on reasoning or evidence. But if you get to you know, the stage where you're uh, proposing, a, uh, if you're submitting your article for, or paper for review at a journal and you've left out an explanation that the reviewer thinks is a viable one, then that's going to be a deal breaker. So you want to start off uh, thinking broadly about the alternative explanations. So where do we come up with these explanations? There may be existing theories in your field, whether it's political science or economics or sociology or psychology or business studies or environmental studies. Uh, and you might look to some other fields than your own uh, if people in those fields have studied your cases or your issue area. Uh, you can look at what historians or regional experts or functional experts have said about your case. You can look at different stakeholders involved in the process in your case, uh, news reporters, uh, uh, and, and see what their implicit theories are about why there was the outcome that occurred. Uh, I've also, in an earlier video, introduced this taxonomy of theories on social mechanisms. So I'm not going to go into it in detail here, but uh, if we think of you know, the vertical axes or columns of legitimacy, material power, and functional efficiency, and the horizontal rows are agent-to-agent -agent mechanisms, structure-to-agent, agent-to-structure, and structure-to-structure. -structure. We've got 12 families of theory here. And you can ask yourself, you know, which of those might plausibly apply to your case? Does your case involve, you know, agents trying to change structures, or does it involve uh, agents interacting directly with each other uh, and exercising material power, for example? Uh, and so you might just think through these 12 categories of theory and see which of them might apply plausibly to explaining your outcome. Uh, you may be able to set aside some of them quickly uh, because 12 is too much to in entertain in most research projects. But it's, it's good to make sure that you haven't left out a major approach to social explanation. 
A second, you want to be equally tough on the alternative explanations. A lot of times people uh, put a lot of emphasis on their favorite explanation and they're going to look deeply for process tracing and eventually they'll find something that's consistent with their explanation. And then some, with the alternatives, they'll sort of look very quickly and if they don't uh, immediately find evidence, then they'll just dismiss them. Well, you got to be, uh, you got to be fair. Uh, and so you have to think not just what would be true if this explanation is true, but what would be true if this explanation is false? And what would be true if this other explanation is true? So think through that uh, systematically for each of the explanations and don't you know, do some of those approaches with one and different ones with, the, with another explanation. The third thing is to think about biases and sources. Uh, are there motivated biases? Are there reasons that people uh, will run a, put some spin on things if you interview them or that they'll only make certain uh, documents available that are flattering to them? There may be unmotivated biases uh, that even though they're not trying to spin the story, people remember things differently. Maybe they just happen to remember things in a way that's favorable to themselves or their reputation. Or maybe they were exposed to only part of the story, to a biased information flow. So there's all kinds of ways that they can have unmotivated biases. They may not be trying to mislead you, but their minds may be misleading both themselves and you. Think of the biases and what's stored in archives, what's made available, what's still classified, what reasons people make information available for their own instrumental purposes. Uh, and uh, so be attentive to all those kinds of potential biases. Uh, carefully interpret your sources. Uh, in what context was something said or written? For what audience? With what potential instrumental purposes or goals of that communication? Uh, you can differentiate between planned communication and spontaneous communication. So something that somebody says off the cuff uh, may more accurately represent their inner thoughts. Uh, whereas if it's something that's planned, it's probably more calculated. Uh, take an example here early in his first administration, George W. Bush was asked about what he would do if you know, there was a, a threat by mainland China against Taiwan. And he sort of said, we would do whatever it takes to defend tai Ch Taiwan, full stop. Well, it wasn't a planned encounter. Uh, he didn't have talking points for it. And the rest of the day, his staff was trying to pull back that statement because that sweeping endorsement of, you know, we're going to defend Taiwan no matter what was contrary to the presence of both parties for the previous 30 years or so. But if you wanted to see his gut instincts, that's what you saw. You want to use multiple sources uh, to make sure that you can triangulate and try not to fall prey to the biases of any one source. I talked a little bit about that when I talked about archival research in another video. You want to pay attention to the silences. What used to be said that's no longer said? What's the elephant in the living room that nobody wants to publicly talk about, but it's clearly driving a lot of the behavior, right? Uh, number five, you have to decide where and when to start. How far back in time are you going to go? Uh, maybe you're looking for some critical juncture that sort of starts off uh, the explanatory story that you're looking at. Uh, but you can always, you know, make one of two mistakes. You could go back too far uh, to Adam and Eve and you're just wasting your time talking about long distant things that don't really have much immediate effect on the events you're studying. Or you could not go far uh, enough back Whereas if you'd just gone a little bit further to some previous episode or critical juncture, that you would see that those are the events that really drove all the action. So I, I can't give you a general rule for how far back is too far back or how, how far back is not far enough. Uh, but, you know, sort of look into it and whatever point you decide to start, look a little bit further earlier in that and make sure you're not missing some of the causal story. Uh, there's also a common temptation I find very frequently in students, a PhD students, to have what I call a two-stage research design. A lot of times people are interested in, you know, uh, what are the sources of this particular policy? Why did actors choose this policy? And they're also interested in what are the effects of that policy or that choice, right? So in the first stage, the policy is the dependent variable. Why was it chosen? Why did it take place? In the second stage, the policy is an independent variable, which then interacts with the efforts of other actors and institutions and all kinds of other things. Well, you can do that, and, and often, you know, those are two related questions, and that, you know, there's, there's a reason we're often curious about both 
how something is brought about and what are the effects of that thing. But the challenge here is it can actually sort of be two research projects. There may be some overlap in the cases you might choose to study the first stage and the second stage, but they won't be exactly the same. And the theories that you choose to address the first stage of how the policy came about, again, they may be different, even if there's some overlap. Uh, they may be different from the theories that explain the second stage of what are the effects of that policy. So it's not impossible to do that, but it's, it, is, it can be challenging because it's almost like doing two separate research projects and just be aware that that's what you're doing and be clear to your readers when you're switching you know, between the first and the second stage and what's the case selection for each stage and what are the theories for each stage and what are the independent variables for each stage because in the second stage, the dependent variable, the first stage is now an independent variable, right? So look for critical junctures, as I mentioned, for starting points. Uh, one challenge here is there are potential critical junctures that could have changed events, but they didn't. And so we want to be aware of those uh, as well, although it's harder to define what constitutes a potential critical juncture that wasn't realized. Then we also have to think about when to stop. When is enough evidence? There's no general rule for this that covers every project. Uh, here again, you can make one of two mistakes. You could keep gathering more and more evidence uh, when in fact it's not really changing your understanding of the phenomena. Or you could stop too soon where if you just gathered a little bit more evidence, it might have profoundly changed your understanding of the phenomena or your estimation of which alternative explanation is likely to be true. So essentially we stop when we think the added uh, effort involved uh, is going to turn up evidence whose value is not worth the effort that it took. And that's a somewhat you know, subjective uh, estimate. Uh, when I talk in the next video about Bayesianism, I'll give you an, a way to think about the value or the weight of evidence. And so if evidence is potentially powerfully discriminating between alternative explanations, you might go to a great deal of effort to find it. And if the effort is likely to be sort of only weakly discriminating or what we call straw in the wind evidence, it's not worth a great deal of effort to find it. So you'll have to make a trade off between how hard is it to get the evidence, how, how costly is it, and how much might it potentially be worth, uh, depending on what that evidence will show. Some other best practices uh, in an earlier video on research design, I showed how we might combine process tracing within case analysis with cross case comparisons. So process tracing is a very important complement to any most similar case comparison or least similar case comparison. Uh, and to other kinds of cases uh, as well, uh, pathway cases, deviant cases, and so on. We want to be open to inductive insights. As I said earlier, we want to be, at, I would say, be as deductive as you can up front. Think about alternative explanations uh, that, are, that you can take off the shelf from prior work and prior theory. But as you go into the research, be very sensitive, sensitive to and aware of new evidence that doesn't fit your existing theories, because that's, that's to be prized. That, that, that subjective experience of surprise, that means you're learning something, which is what research is all about. And so if you come across something that you weren't expecting, then think about it, theorize about it, uh, maybe add it as a theory or add it as an independent variable uh, to your uh, research. Uh, Use deduction to in, uh, uh, infer what should be true if this hypothesis is true, what would be true of the, uh, about the process, what would be true about the outcome and the timing of the outcome and the magnitude of the outcome. I find a common shortcoming in early drafts of PhD students' work is they don't think concretely about how a process would work. You have to think very specifically. What would this look like? Who would say what to whom? What would be the sequence of events? You have to be very specific here. And a lot of times uh, students are too general or sort of, uh, you know, uh, uh, kind of accept too readily black box explana explanations where the, the details are unclear. You want to be very specific about how would that actually have happened if this hypothesis were true. And then finally, we should remember that process tracing is not necessarily conclusive. If we don't have strong evidence that powerfully discriminates between alternative explanations, we may not be able to say something uh, convincing about which explanation really accounts for the outcome. 
It's, it's uh, analogous to if you were the district attorney and you're trying to prosecute a murder case, you just may not have strong enough evidence to definitively point to one suspect or another. And if that's the case, whether you're the district attorney or a researcher, you should just report that. Maybe you've been able to, uh, to uh, exclude the conventional wisdom as an explanation, but maybe you still can't discriminate among the other viable alternative explanations. Well, that's still a contribution, right? But we don't want to overstate the degree of uh, certitude or confidence we have. Uh, we want to be true to the, the weight of the evidence and not exaggerate. Okay, so that's just some practical advice about process tracing. Uh, in a few minutes, I'll give you some exercises that if you're doing a class with me, we'll do together or you can do on your own. Uh, because the more practice you get at this, like anything else, the better you get at it. So let me uh, talk about some of the advantages of process tracing. It gets us closer to the causal action. It gets us closer to the way that causal mechanisms operate because those mechanisms operate in particular contexts, in particular cases. And so this is one of the great advantages of process tracing and of case studies of which process tracing is one method. It compensates for some of the challenges of correlational or statistical study. You can start to unpiece the causal direction by just looking in detail at the sequence of events. You can start to uh, get that endogeneity problem by looking at whether you know, the sequence led from A to B or B to A, or maybe in one time period it went in one direction and then it turned around and went the other direction. Uh, you can look for potential spuriousness. Is there some other variable that's causing both A and B to change at the same time and do the process tracing on that. Uh, the inductive side here helps you to identify variables or, or theories about mechanisms that were left out of existing explanations. So this is a very powerful contribution. Almost every variable in, in whatever literature you want to look at, if you ask where did that variable come from, where was it first theorized, almost always it's a case study, right? Uh, because it's close to the action. Uh, with statistics, we start off with the variables and theories that we've already theorized about. And there's not much that's inductive as far as coming up with new theories. In fact, there's a reason you don't want to do that too much in statistics, because if you just keep trying out new theories and new models, well, you're going to get a lot of accidental correlations that look statistically significant, but they're really just random. So this uh, theory generating side uh, is a big advantage of process tracing. Process tracing can also get at equal finality. When there are different paths to the same outcome, you can just trace out with the process tracing what each one of those paths look like, what is, what's the interaction of different variables on that path, what's the sequencing that's common to that path, and so on. Some of the disadvantages of process tracing, it can take a lot of information and time. Uh, my first... Uh, uh, major uh, project, my dissertation, later my first book, uh, I read through, you know, uh, uh, daily translations of Russian uh, newspapers and, uh, and TV and so on that amounted to about 70 pages a day. Uh, I didn't have to read all 70 pages, but there'd be three or four pages a day, so maybe a thousand pages a year for a period of about 20 years. And that was just one of the sources that I was looking at. I was also translating Russian journals and all sorts of other, and then the secondary information, secondary literature. So it took me a long time. Uh, and so, you know, it, it's not always that intensive, but it, it can be pretty intensive to get the information, to do the interviews, to do the archival research, uh, and to go way into the details. Uh, there can also be gaps in the evidence. There'll be evidence that you can't access. Somebody refuses to be interviewed by you. Uh, the archives are classified or destroyed or just, you know, the documents were kept or whatever else. And so there can be gaps in the sequence of events that you can't document as well as you would like. Uh, there's also lots of potential biases in the information that's made available to you. Uh, what do people store in documents? What do they make available? Who's willing to talk to you in an interview and so on? Uh, and as I indicated earlier, the results may still be indeterminate. Not all process tracing is strongly pointing to one explanation uh, or another. Uh, also, ad existing theories are very general usually, and you have to uh, detail how would this theory apply in the context of my case studies. And people might disagree about what a theory should predict in a particular 
case. And then finally, as I've discussed uh, early in some other videos, there's a challenge of generalizing. Once you've found a conclusive explanation for the case, there's still the question of whether that uh, explains other cases, what kinds of other cases, what are the scope conditions of this finding, and so on. You may have some clues from uh, uh, about that. You know, uh, once you understand how you think the mechanisms worked, you can extrapolate to, you know, are those common conditions, uh, uh, the ones that made the mechanisms work or enabled it, are those common conditions in many other cases or are they rare? And that gives you some ideas about generalizing or maybe you generalize to a particular a combination of variables or a type uh, in a typology uh, that's like the case that you've studied. Okay, so that's some observations and advice on traditional process tracing. Let me just briefly uh, introduce, uh, I'm going to do some, uh, uh, I've, I've created some exercises. If you go to this link, and, and apologies if you don't have the PowerPoint so you can just click on it, it's a lot to type in, but uh, I have some exercises there uh, uh, that work through different aspects of process tracing, different challenges in process tracing, challenges of getting information, of interpreting information, and so on. Uh, so if you're taking a class with me, uh, go to that link, uh, work through the exercise and uh, exercises, and then we'll talk about them uh, in class. If you're doing it on your own, I think you'll still find it valuable to go through these exercises.